joined the retreat. We were so excited about it, we checked in on Thursday night. And about 2 a.m. on Friday morning, I woke up with a fever and uncontrollable shivers. Uh, I had to stand under the shower just, just to get the shivers down. So after we thought about it, we spoke with our uh, uh, doctor from the Thai side, but he lives in Canada, so it's all right to call him at 2 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and after consultation, we felt that in this age of COVID, the only responsible thing to do was to check out. So we checked out at 3 a.m. and then went to the hospital at 4 a.m. for a COVID test. Uh, and we got the results that evening. I'm COVID negative. Uh, but I had some kind of infection, which uh, on Monday, the doctor said I had bronchitis. I haven't had a temperature for the last four days, uh, and I think it's on the way out, and that's why I decided to uh, fulfill my sermon obligations. If not, David will be speaking as well. Uh, but today, if I don't spend too much time interacting with you, it's just to be on the side of caution, all right? But uh, I did participate in the camp uh, virtually on, on my phone and I followed in most of the proceedings and I'm glad to see that you all had a great time. So, so thank you for your understanding on that. I'm sorry once again that you couldn't join me. But join me in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts to listen to the Word of God. Living and loving God, you are Lord over all, and we thank you that you bind us together because we are your children. You tell us that we are part of this living and eternal vine. We are the branches, and we need to abide in you. So, the nourishment for the vine is surely your eternal word. And now, as we come to the Gospel of Matthew, as we look in this seventh chapter, we pray that you would speak and teach us about your purposes, grant us your wisdom, and give us faith to believe in your word. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been in a sermon series, for those who are, you who are new with us, uh, we have gone through the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. And I have said, uh, or all three of us, Greg, David, and I, we, we have said that this was a really era-changing sermon. You, you'll, there's never going to be another sermon like it. I mean, if you think about it, I don't think there's any other sermon in history that was remembered by the place where it was preached. Think about that. I mean, you may have the Gettysburg address, but, but that was the scene of a huge battle, not just remembered for, for the fact that it was preached there. And this was a sermon on the mount by Galilee, and, and they have a, a chapel there. And you go there, and it's such a beautiful setting, a, a natural setting for people to sit on the side of the mountain. Uh, many people now believe Jesus wasn't on the top of the mountain, preaching downwards, because if you think of the people listening, it's kind of uncomfortable to be sitting on the side of the mountain facing up. <laughs> you naturally want to fall over. It makes more sense if you're sitting on the side of the mountain and the preacher was down at the bottom, wouldn't it? Then you could recline nicely and you could listen to him. Also behind him would have been the Sea of Galilee. And water projects sound. And on the shores of Galilee, it's pebbles. Large pebble stones which would again reflect sound. Remember Jesus didn't have the benefit of these implements and he had to use his voice. And if he was going to speak all day, uh, it needed to have natural amplification. But what I'm saying is, 
it's not so much all of these things as much as what he said. He was preaching to the Jews and it was a completely mind-boggling, life-changing shift in theology. Okay? Because these were Jews primarily following him. And they were well versed in the Torah, the law, and the traditions that, that came with their being identified as, as Jewish people. And suddenly Jesus says, it is said, an eye for an eye, but I say to you, forgive those who hurt you. So, it was so radical, he had to kind of put in caveats there. He says, I have not come to abolish the law. What you're listening to may sound like it. It may sound as if I'm saying the law doesn't count and I'm giving you something new, but I'm not. I'm helping you understand the heart of the law. It is the spirit of the law that we want to look at. And this was the radical change that came in this sermon that was preached around the mountains. God is love, God is spirit, and, and it's not just the letter of the law. Man, Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. But what does that mean? That we are not there just to fulfill the laws of God. God has given us laws to fulfill us. So we have to have that context. Now, to our present times. I came uh, across this little anecdote. It said during an earthquake that occurred, the inhabitants of a small village were generally very alarmed and distressed and they ran out on the street. <coughs> but there was an old lady there in the village whom everyone knew and she seemed to be unafraid and at peace. And so after a time they, they looked at her and they said, Mother, I mean they, they call her mother in the village, Mother, aren't you afraid? No, she replied, I rejoice to know that I have a God who can shake the world. I suppose you can always look for something positive in difficult circumstances. I'm not that sure if I were in an earthquake, I'll be rejoicing that God can <laughs> shake the earth. Uh, I'll say, right Lord, I believe you can, but how about you give it a break for now? But today we look around us and the earth is being shaken. In some places, literally. In most other places, figuratively. The very foundations of the things we believe in are being shaken and tested, are they not? We used to think that work and school was something that is there, like death and income tax. Uh, it, it's going to be there and you're going to go. But all of a sudden, there is a question. Those norms have been shaken, have they not? We can't take school for granted. If the pandemic continues to escalate, many schools will shut down. People still work at home or even on alternate schedules where you go to work a few days a week and you stay at home and work other days. Financial markets are being tested. The hospitality industry, the airline industry has been shaken like it's never been before. Right? Singapore Airlines has had a reduction of 93% of its flights. 93% of its flights. Just in March, I remember walking into Changi Airport, that's the airport in Singapore. And it's a huge airport, uh, the arrival hall, and it's usually packed. And I'm always giving thanks that I have a Singaporean passport and I can go through the express lane. I walked down in March this year. I was the only person in the arrival hall. I have a photo I can show you. I came down the escalator. I said, nobody will believe me if I tell them. So I took a photo from the top of the escalator. 
nobody in the arrival hall. The foundations of our economy, of life as we know it, are being shaken. And no one will disagree that we live in uncertain times. And so I've titled this message, Certainty in Uncertain Times. How can we find certainty in uncertain times? In times of uncertainty, we are not left without hope. As children of God, as believers in Christ, we are not like so many sailors drifting at sea in a storm. We're not alone in the storms of this life. We have a sure footing and a sure foundation. Now, the week before the retreat, David spoke about judging, that we should not be too quick to judge, and if anything, we should assess ourselves more carefully. But this week, I would like to look at three portions of Matthew chapter 7. If you can take out your Bibles or your phones, I love this gentleman. What's your name, sir? Again? Okay. Yeah. Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> got a great big Bible. That's old school, man. Hallelujah. <laughs> He's got this big Bible on his lap. Uh, I know most of the time we have to now refer to our phony Bibles. I can't resist that one either. So if you turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, the first portion, I'd like, look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. And these three elements will help us in uncertain times. The first is provision. Provision. When, when things go bad, we worry about what we have, right? So we had earlier in the pandemic all this hoarding. And what did people hoard? <laughs> Toilet paper. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> I, I still haven't figured that out. Why of all the important things in life must you hoard toilet paper? Okay, we shan't even go there. But people worry about what they have. And immediately the instinct is to rush down to the stores and buy up. Because what happens if it's sold out and I can't get any more, right? So provision obviously is uppermost in our minds in uncertain times. What do I have? What do I need? How am I going to get more? What happens if I don't have it? All of these things. What does Jesus say? Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 Ask and it will be given to you <coughs> Seek and you will find Knock and the door will be opened to you Verse 8 For everyone who asks receives The one who seeks finds And to the one who knocks the door will be opened Which of you If your son asks for bread Will give him a stone Or if he asks for a fish Will give him a snake Verse 11 if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, immediately, I know there may be some people who start to feel uneasy. Because you may be inclined to think, is, is he of the prosperity gospel uh, strain of Christianity? What is that? There, there is a, quite a large group there who, who say, well, here's what Jesus says. Ask, seek, knock. He will give to you. He will open to you, right? No, no. Let's look at the context. Jesus says here in the sermon, he, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these things will be added or provided for you. Right? 
So what is the context of this ask, seek, and knock? It pertains very obviously to me to the things of the kingdom. When you're seeking something pertaining to his kingdom and his kingdom's work, he will provide for you. This is not a blank check. Let me say that. This is not a blank check. And if people take this and say, look, Jesus said, ask for anything. See, you will find. Knock, it will be open to you. Oh, your business, you should knock on the doors of all these contracts and they will be open to you. I think that is an abuse of the gospel. Jesus came to say the kingdom of heaven has come. Jesus' sole mission was about bringing the kingdom of God to be amongst us. Right? So we have to understand that context and that purpose. Our sin not pertains to the things of the kingdom. And it's interesting here that Jesus uses the context of parenthood. There would have been many kids there in that group. The, I don't think nanny services were, were the order of the day. So if they want to listen to, to this rabbi, then the kids came along. That's why we have the feeding of the 5,000. There was a kid there with his picnic, with his McDonald's happy meal, right? Five loaves and two fish. So the kids were amongst them. And so he says, your parents here, you're sitting here, and this is a family church, and most of you have come with your children. So he says, think about it. Even you know how to give good gifts to your children. Is there any parent here who would say to your child, you can have anything you want? All the kids are saying that sounds like not a bad idea. It may sound appealing, but I can tell you, if your parents really did that, it would destroy you. If you really got everything and anything you want, I can guarantee you will not do well. Let me tell you, we, we have a retreat center in our home and a couple of years ago, a group came, a group of about six ladies, I think, and they sat there and the first night as they were sharing, after they had shared, I just turned to one of the ladies and I said, I just have this sense that you really troubled about something. It's almost like I feel there's a black cloud hanging over you. Why, what is so heavy on your heart? If I'm out of order, forgive me. But I just feel this real heaviness coming from you. She sat there, she cried. All the ladies started crying. And I could go, uh-oh, what did I just, what did I just say? And the story came out. She says she's worried and heavy-hearted about her son. Right? How old is your son? 45. Okay, he's 45. What's the problem? Well, he stays at home. And he and what does he do at home? He plays computer games all day. What is he qualified to do? No, oh, he dropped out of school. So, and, and I mean, this is like a really dumb question. I knew it even as I asked it. So I was, like, what's your problem right now? Well, I don't know what's going to become of him when my husband and I pass away. How old are you now? 71. How old is your husband? 74. And I look at her and I said, kick your son out of the house. She says, he can't do anything. In fact, the, the ladies turn they say, you know, it's really bad, you don't understand. He's big. And when and he abuses his parents. When he doesn't get the food he wants, he smashes the food and they have to clean up the whole place and they have to get the food that he wants. Okay. 
That night, I was thinking and praying about this lady, and then it came back to me. It suddenly, you know, when you're this old, the archives go back a long, long ways, and the search engine's really poor. At least I've got the really slow version of the search engine. So somewhere about 4 a.m. it goes bing. I said, oh my goodness. They were in my church. They were in my church like 35 years ago. And the next morning I checked and I was right. And I remember, what did I remember? This boy was about, I would say nine at the time. And he would come into church towards the end of the service because Sunday school got out. And he would just run through the church. And after the service would end and people were praying, he would be jumping on the pews, literally climbing up and jumping on the back of the pews. And I remember telling the ushers, don't let that boy in. Don't keep him out of the sanctuary until everything is over. It's too disruptive. The father came up to me one Sunday. He was really upset. He says, you can't ban your, my son from coming into church. I said, yes, I can. He says, how can you stop someone coming into the house of God? I said, I would not stop someone coming into the house of God if that person was seeking God. He's coming in here because he's looking for a playground. This is a sanctuary, not a playground. If you can't control your son, he doesn't come in here. The family left the church. And I meet them 35 years later. Really? Ask, seek, knock, you get whatever you want. God is a good, good father. We just, we, we, we sing that song, you're a good, good father. He doesn't give us everything we want and we should thank God that he doesn't. We should thank God that he doesn't. Amen? Think of what would happen if you really got everything you asked for. Your life would be a mess. And therein lies the wisdom, and I'll end this point. Therein lies the wisdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His wisdom, His righteousness. Then these things will be added to you. Okay? So don't worry about provision. Seek first His kingdom and He will provide these other things. The second point, in these uncertain times, who can we trust? Who can we look to? Who can guide us? So the first is about provision, the second is about provenance. provenance. What is provenance? When, when someone says, this is an antique pot, the antique store owner is going to check on the provenance. Okay? They're going to check and say, do you have it certified? Do you, do you have official proof that this is really a pot from the Ming dynasty? And, and what evidence do you have of its provenance? That means it, it's, its value, its validity. Okay? So, here Jesus gives us a bit of guidance. Because you can imagine, well, throughout history, but certainly in Jesus' time, uh, we, we know that there were many teachers. We call them now, of course, on hindsight, false teachers. But in those days, who knew? And Jesus certainly was bringing an extremely radical message. Who is this young guy? He's a young adult, 30 years old. You know, the rabbis usually are scholarly. They're, they're all like Leslie before they even try to teach. And who is this young fellow? And he claims that he knows everything about the kingdom of God. 
that he's come to fulfill the law and the prophets. Who is this guy? So Jesus gave them a very simple test. You know the test. I, I call it the fruit tree test. It's the fruit tree test, right? Verse 18, chapter 7. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 20. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. The fruit tree test. Use that. In these uncertain times, you, you may have someone come up and say, Hey, I've got an investment scheme for you. Right? I'm investing in uh, like what Amazon does. Now everybody is going online, so here, here is this uh, investment that you can invest in these companies that sell things online. You say, oh, that's not a bad idea. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are so many scams out there today, right? Is that true? Right now I get a friend request on Facebook. My standard reply is, nice to hear from you. Because we live in this age of scams, please tell me something only you and I would know. That is not, that cannot be found in your online information. And I can tell you, I would say more than half of these friend requests, they never come back when I, when I tell them that. When I say, tell me something personal, only you and I will know. They don't even come back. So there are all kinds of scams going on today. How do we verify? We really have to be wise uh, as serpents. I wasn't planning on sharing this, but here's a note of caution. My wife was trying to sell a, an old bed. And she gets an inquiry and, and that person says, Yes, I want to buy your I want to purchase your bed. And the person says, I have already transferred the money for, for the purchase into your account. But she sees nothing on her account. PayPal. PayPal. He says, I've already transferred it. Then she says, I I'm not seeing anything. And the guy says, well, it's there. Trust me. That's a red flag, right? It's there in your account. Trust me. What I need you to do is pay this extra fee. Because I've paid it already into PayPal, I can't retract it. So my money is stuck there. But I need you to pay this extra fee. And then the money will be re released to you. And he's actually got a PayPal looking website. But fortunately, Lynn uses PayPal a lot. And she put it up next to the real PayPal site. And the other one is a clear copy of it. Okay? So when she finally says, I am not uh, transferring any money or anything. Uh, if I don't see money in my account. And that's the end of the conversation. So there are people out there today, just sitting there on their computers, going to these websites where you sell stuff. And then they come on and they tell you, I purchased yours, I transferred money into your account. Uh, please re release your item. And they say, I haven't seen the money. They say, please give me another fee to release the money I've already paid to you. Okay? So just imagine that. This is all over the place. But what about the people whom you know physically? You are visiting us? Do yeah. you know anything about BCF? No? Okay, well, welcome, but please check me out. <laughs> check me out. Speak with the people here. I take my name down, you can Google it. We need to be very, very wise and cautious in today's world. Is that true? Would you agree? Right. 
So I remember when I was a young pastor, starting out in 1984-85, there was recession in Singapore. And we were interviewing certain people uh, to link them up with church members who had work opportunities. Okay? And I remember sitting on the interview panel with a couple of the church leaders who were uh, much more senior than I. And I remember one of the leaders who, who I love dearly and have learned so much from, he would always ask the, the uh, interviewee, so what do you do on weekends? What do you do for your leisure? And after the second or third time during our lunch break, I turned to him and I said, Robert, why, why, why do you always ask about their, their leisure time? He says, anyone can put up a good resume. And they can have good referrals. But I have found, if I know what you do with your leisure time, I get a better idea of who you are. I thought that was very wise, and I've held on to that all my life. And I've had my companies and business and so forth, and I've interviewed people. I asked the question, what do you do on weekends? Look at the person's whole life, and this fruit tree test will become quite clear. What is their marriage like? What are their children like? What do their neighbors think of them? What do their colleagues think of them? What do the people, if they have people who work under them, what does their servant, their gardener, what do they think of them? I, I learned something that, that I apply all the time. I'm very careful to watch of how a person speaks. You pardon the term, it's not derogatory, but just for purposes of communication. I always watch of how a person speaks to the little people. We go out to a business meal, when the waiter comes, how does this person speak to the waiter? They oh, don't worry, we'll take care of you, this is your app, all huh, give me this. Yes, 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 what I was I saying? All the red flags go. Because I think a decent human being, a good person, a person I'm prepared to trust and do business with, should be kind and hospitable right across the board. Isn't it a huge red flag? That he will speak to the waiter unkindly and harshly and curtly, then, then it tells me something. It, it gives me a, a, a discomfort with the value system. Okay? David just spoke about not judging. So, so I want to be careful there. And I just try to share with you some practical issues. Observe the person in a bigger context. I, I used to be in the golf industry and I, I used to teach a class called Business Golf. And one of the reasons why golf is so popular amongst businessmen, you can tell a lot of personality traits by the way they play. And I don't think it's exclusive to golf. Just look amongst your friends and see all you guys, you play basketball, you play soccer, you do athletics. Sports reveals the character of a person. I know some world champions that I won't name, but there are a couple there that I don't want to watch because they may be world champions and no doubt about their talents and their giftings. But in their arena, they abuse the referees, they abuse, abuse the ball boys and the ball girls. That tells me something about their value system. Okay? So, in these uncertain times, check on the provenance of the people who you are going to have to trust or rely on. I will just put this out there. For many years, it was our practice in, in about 
June or July to tell the church that we are up for re-nomination as leaders in, in, in BCF and we bring up 1st Timothy chapter 3 and we say use this this is the yardstick we have chosen by which we should be evaluated the leaders here do we have good marriages do our children exhibit characteristics of children who have grown up in the house, a family that knows and loves the Lord. Look, look at our lives, look at all of our lives, the people we interact with. Come, come and speak with our neighbors. Check up on us. I invite you to do that. This is the minimal accountability that we should have to you. By what right do we have to stand up here Sunday after Sunday taking your time? I've always seen it as a privilege. You, you could be asleep in bed or in the park or, or someplace nicer than this. You come here and you, and you give us your ear and, and, and your mind and, and your lives. And it should never be abused, but you also have to be accountable to what you are listening to. Are you being fed? Are you being fed truth? Are you being fed with things that will nourish you and make you better people and will help you to grow? Or are you taking in stuff that's going to sidewind you somewhere? And suddenly you find yourself up a road that you never wanted to be on. And I've seen people like that. They, they attend an, an assembly or a group, and, and it's a big group. Well, 20,000 people can't be wrong. Trust me, they can. <laughs> And, and what is being preached there? Ask, seek, knock. God will give you. He's a loving Father. His kingdom is abundant. Whatever you want, God will bless you with. Don't worry. Just claim it in Jesus' name. It will be yours. It says when two or three are gathered and agree, we will be bound on earth as it is in heaven. You can have it whatever you want. And the guy comes up and gives testimony. Oh, I wanted a new house. And I got my neighbor and we, we, we prayed about it. And God gave me a new house. It, yeah, you keep on going. You keep on going. What's going to happen? One day you're going to ask for something and you're not going to get it. For whatever reason. You're not going to get it. The ducks don't always line up. And you don't get it and what happens? You're disappointed because God let you down. Right? No. Our relationship with God is based on submission. Your will be done, not mine. Give me this day my daily bread. God wants a daily, constant, consistent relationship with Him. Not give me what I, Lord, if you just show me and, and, and promise to me what I need for the next five years, I won't trust you again. <laughs> that doesn't require faith. So I encourage you. As we journey through these uncertain times together. Trust God for His provision. Use your own wisdom and discernment to check on the providence of those things that you need to rely on. And finally, prudence. Prudence. In these uncertain times, it is important for us, especially here, all the families, I want to encourage you you need firm foundations not only for your marriage for your children especially so Jesus has this exhortation here chapter 7 verse 24 therefore everyone who hears these words of mine <coughs> and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock 
The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. Verse 26, But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand, beachfront property. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Parents, what foundations are you putting in place for your children so that they can weather the storms of life that will inevitably hit them? There is no way you are going to shelter your child or your children from every storm and eventuality. Right? That's like standing in front of the tide and saying, stop. It's not going to happen. So it's far more prudent that you build their lives on a firm foundation. Scripture tells us what that firm foundation is. Who is the firm foundation? Who? Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. Right? Do you know what a cornerstone is? It's not the memorial stone that on this day and whatever, so and so put this uh, building uh, stone in place. That's a memorial stone. The cornerstone is literally what it is. The masons will fashion this stone that is perfectly right angled. It has to be perfectly right angled and thereafter every line and measurement is taken from that stone. Imagine if that stone were two degrees off on an angle, and you were building a 102-story building. You could do that if you're attempting to replicate the leaning tower. But it's so important to get the cornerstone, the angles correct. We rebuilt our home. 2013, we started building. No, was that 2013? No, we moved in 2013. We started building 2011. Our, our house is further up the Bangna Trap, and it's by a lake. And I can tell you the earth there is not earth, it's mud. I remember seeing a neighbor somewhere building in the they put in a cement tile, it was like about that wide and it had a hole and they, they put it there and they let it go and it just sank in. So when we spoke with uh, the, the builders of our home, they said, oh, in this area of Bangna, you only need six meters of piling. Okay, because yours is it's not a heavy home and most of it is single story, it's, it's not heavy, six meters of piling would be enough. I said, no. We, we, we said no, uh, my architect here, right? We, we said no, and I said, listen, you put the pile down, the day you put the first pile, I want to be there, and you keep piling until I hear, come, and it's hit the bedrock. He says, you don't need to go down to the bedrock. I said, the book I'm reading says I do. <laughs> you go down to the bedrock. And it was about 20, 20 over meters. Okay? So it's almost four times the price for the piling. And I said, look, don't stint on this. We will pay for the foundation. Now, here's the literal illustration. We have a swimming pool in our home. And after we put the, the pool, and I said, especially make sure every pile under that pool hits the bedrock, okay? The last thing I need is a crack in the pool. 
that never gets solved. So make sure it hits the bedrock. After we did the pool, we realized we needed a broader pool deck. So they put up the pool deck. But we were careless, we didn't check. The pool deck, they didn't go down to the bedrock. They put six meters of piling. Within two years, the pool deck started to separate from the pool. And the electrics and the plumbing and everything had a problem because the pipes would separate. We spent how much more money trying to fix the pool deck because the foundation didn't go down to the rock. That's a straight up illustration for you. It's not an analogy. It actually happened. And we had to spend a whole lot more to put in micro piling to reinforce what was under the pool deck. Let me tell you, I've seen so many lives trying to put in micro piling after the fact to rectify the lack of a firm foundation. And there are certain things in life you go on that far down, it's only rectification and repair. There's no restoration. Right? It's too far gone. We have two daughters, and all of their lives, and even as they prepare to leave home, I've said, I have only one wish from you. This is all I ask of you. Before they left for university and it wasn't please study hard, please stay away from bad things and mix with good, no. I said I only ask one thing of you. Hang on to your relationship with Jesus. Like it means your life. Because it does. Daddy's been a pastor for 40 years. I've very rarely seen a good outcome when people let go of their relationship with Jesus. He is the one sure, true constant that will guard our hearts and our minds, who will correct us, who will convict us. Here is the only one I know who can restore us. He's the only one I know who can keep us on this path that is so filled with temptation and oil and traps and deception. The world is not an easy place to traverse. And we have grown up in, in relatively safe environments. We, we're not, you know, tested in, in war-torn countries and, and persecuted countries and so forth. And even then, with all of the privilege that we have enjoyed, it's still been a test. We live in a fallen world. The prince of this world does not have our good at heart. And he will use all the things of the world to bring down that which God has intended for us. And we have to guard against that. And I frequently remind my girls, and I, I'm glad that now I, I have more opportunity to thank them, how grateful I am that they have granted me this wish, that they have kept this relationship with Jesus. One went to Melbourne, the other one went to London, and they, they're on opposite ends of the earth. How, how do we police them? How do we check them? No way. And frankly, no need. As long as they keep that relationship with Christ, God will be their strength and their guide. Right? So I encourage you, the days ahead will not necessarily become more certain. If anything, they're likely to become more uncertain. 
we may have periods of relative calm, but it seems to me that just the way the world has evolved, it's so interconnected. Someone gets a bug in China and it goes around the world. And now everything will never be the same again. That's how interdependent and interconnected we are. So we have to come back rest in the Word of God. We have to hold fast to our relationship with the living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These are the things that will give us certainty in an uncertain world. And also, of course, the fellowship of believers. Here at Mount Mount Christian Fellowship, I always call it my family away from family. We don't have any blood relatives here. But right now, if something were to happen, David is the best brother I have. <laughs> David and Greg have to be my brothers. Right? Because my brother is not close enough to help. If something happens with them, I trust that they will look to me as a brother. And that I will respond as a brother. And, and all of us, for one another, we have to be here for one another because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So, I want to encourage you. I mean, it seems like such a morbid message. We're talking about uncertain times all the time. But you know what? I think the joy of the Lord is still God's heart for you. And I want to close with this little story I came across. It, apparently the Persians tell the story that they had a, a king who said he wanted to be happy. He had all the wealth, he had all the power, but for whatever reason he wasn't happy. Well, I mean, simple reason, wealth and power doesn't necessarily mean you're happy. Uh, so he spoke to his wise men and they told him, if you can find the coat of a truly happy man and put it on, you will be happy. So he thought, where should I find such a coat? It's not at Central, it's not at Robinson's. I know they sell happy coats, but that's not exactly what we have in mind. Where can I find such a coat? So he thought and he said, maybe if I went to the community of the wealthy, someone may possess such a happy coat. And he went and he spoke with the... What happened? He ran out of breath. That doesn't matter. Can I use this instead? This is just like me, run out of battery. <laughs> My battery is on low already. Okay. Anyway, so he's looking for this happy coat, and it's not amongst the wealthy. Then he thought, I'll go to the universities, the wise, the learned people of my kingdom, and maybe they find happiness in their wisdom, that they've understood how to deal with sadness in this world. So he went amongst the learned and the scholarly and there was no coat to be found. Finally one day as he was in the streets, someone said, down the street there is an extremely happy man and he declares himself to be the happiest man in the kingdom. And he found this man and this guy was working away in the streets carrying stones and and yet he was singing and he had a smile on his face and he waved at everyone that went by and he says, wow, this is truly a happy man. So he went up to him and he says, I notice, sir, you're a happy man. And he says, indeed I am. I claim every day that I am the happiest man in the kingdom. He says, well, if that's the case, 
Can I purchase your coat? I will give you a bag of gold. Whatever you ask, I will give you for this coat of happiness. And the man turned to him and smiled and said, Kind and generous king, you don't need to purchase this coat from me. I would give it to you. The only problem is, I don't have a coat. <laughs> I'll let you think about that over lunch. Let us pray. Abba, Father, you who long to give good gifts to your children, we know that they are good because they will not destroy us. We know that these good gifts help us to build ourselves up, to build our neighbors up, and to build your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us these gifts, O oh Lord. For these gifts we ask, we seek, we knock. Give us wisdom to who we trust and the foundations on which we build and establish our lives. Father, we thank you for the precious gift of Jesus Christ. In these uncertain times, in these stormy days, he is with us. He is on board, he's in the boat, and he sleeps because his faith is in his Father who controls the storm. We rejoice that we have a Father who indeed can shake the foundations of the earth. And our world is being shaken at this time. But for a purpose, Lord. We may not understand that purpose. It may not yet be time for that purpose to be revealed. But we know that in all of these things we are more than conquerors. If we are being shaken, it is for our own self-examination. It is for our own change and improvement. Father, we want to trust you. So we offer our lives afresh to you. If there's anyone here who as yet doesn't have that foundational relationship with you, I pray that you would stand at the door and knock. Knock at their hearts. Your spirit may open the door. By the prompting of your spirit, they may open the door and you might reveal yourself to them. Speak to them in ways that they can understand and recognize and receive from you. We pray for all these families who are traveling at this time. We pray for their time together that it might be rich and fulfilling. And we thank you for the family that is here at BCF. Help us to care and love one another as Christ loves us. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.